Peter B. Collins News and Comment. It's Tuesday, December 19th, 2017. As we gear down for the holidays, I'll have a podcast for you tomorrow, and then I'm going to take a break. But if news happens while I'm on break, I'll crack the microphone and serve up a podcast for you. We'll just have to see how it goes. Now, I don't keep track of video game sales, but uh, I know that one of the best sellers over the years has been this grisly game called Grand Theft Auto. Probably you've seen it, if not played it. And it's loaded with sex and drugs and violence and uh, all kinds of stuff. You get points for killing cops. And Grand Theft Congress could be the next popular video game as the player manipulates members of Congress to give them a tax cut. (laughs) No matter what it does to the economy, and no matter how ill-deserved it might be. And so we are seeing a heist of major proportions take place before our very eyes. The House of Representatives today approved the conference report on the tax cuts for corporations and the ultra-wealthy. By a vote of 227 to 203, there are 12 Republicans who stayed out, who voted against it. Mostly Republicans who are in electoral trouble in the coming year and who live in high uh, local and state tax states like California, New York, New Jersey, and Illinois. And despite their defections, we don't see a similar prospect in the Senate where zero Democrats are expected to vote for it when it is put on the floor tonight or tomorrow, and virtually all of the present Republicans. Now, we know John McCain, who is battling brain cancer and may never return to the Senate, is uh, at home in Arizona for the holidays, but uh, they appear to have all the votes they need. And despite the fact that polls show that 55% of the public opposes this package, only 33% supports it, you can expect it will pass. And in a moment, we'll name some of the worst Republicans responsible for this. But first, take a look at the distribution here. If you are at the lowest portion of the American income scale, less than $25,000 a year, your tax cut will be about $60. Don't spend it all at once. If you're in the middle income quintile, which is earnings of about 49000 up to $86,000, your tax cut's going to be about 900 bucks. Don't spend it all in one place. Now, if you uh, earn between eighty six and hundred and fifty grand, your tax cut will be about $1,800. But there are many people, particularly in the high local tax states like California, where individuals in that category will, in fact, see their tax payments go up. And the real winners here are the people in the top 1%, incomes of $733,000 and up, who will get an average tax cut of $51,000. And, of course, they can afford to spend it all at one time, buying a yacht or some diamonds or (laughs) a new luxury automobile. But the guy who really is the devil in this case, who I have labeled a devious sack of shit, is Senator Bob Corker of Tennessee. Now, he's already wrangled with Trump, and he appeared to pose as a principled guy, and he talked about how he couldn't handle this tax package if it put more than a penny onto the long-term national debt. And we know it's at least a trillion dollars with the most optimistic projections of the trickle-down of this tax bill. And Bob Corker made a sudden about-face on Friday. He later admitted he hadn't read the revised version that he decided to vote for, and that he was shocked to learn that it will benefit him to the tune of a prospective $1 million in tax reduction in the coming year or two. That's because Bob Corker benefits from pass-through entities where he invests in real estate. And it doesn't only benefit Corker, it benefits Trump and many other people in the same situation. 
And today at the New York Times, there were double-barreled attacks on Bob Corker. Based on the reporting of David Sirota and colleagues at the International Business Times, who exposed the Republicans who will benefit from this tax bill, and then went after Corker after his shift on Friday, well, David Sirota earns a, a little victory lap here. Because David Leonhardt, the op-ed writer at the Times, picked up on that. And he says while Corker was willing to grandstand against the bill, he wasn't actually willing to be the vote to block it. And we now have what you can call the Corker kickback. And Leonhardt says, well, maybe it was only a handout, not a kickback, but it's still dirty money. And the lead editorial at the Times today goes even further. It opens with this blast. To understand the cynicism and mendacity underlying the Republican tax bill, look no further than a provision that would benefit Trump and other property tycoons that is in the final legislation Congress will vote on. Well, they already have in the House, and it will happen in the Senate in the next 24 hours. The editorial continues. The provision would allow people who make money from real estate to take a 20% deduction on income they earn through limited liability companies, partnerships, and other so-called pass-through entities that don't pay the corporate tax. The beneficiaries would also include members of Congress like Senator Bob Corker, who last week he decided he would vote for the bill even though Republican leaders did nothing to address his concerns about an exploding federal deficit. And so the Times is accurate here. And Corker really has defined himself as a slime ball. He said one thing, but when push came to shove, he caved and decided to vote for this bill. He should, uh, he should pledge to give away his ill-gotten gains, at minimum, if he is ever to cleanse himself of the, <laughs> the way he has soiled himself now. Now, this uh, pass-through income deduction will cost the government $400 billion in lost revenue over 10 years. And to put it in context, it is about 29 times as much as the $14 billion a year that the federal government spends on the Children's Health Insurance Program, which is currently still lapsed. The funding has lapsed, and we don't have any indication that there is a plan to fund it. This may come out in the budget battle later this week with a threat to shut down the government. But chances are they will pass another continuing resolution and defer these issues into 2018. And in an analytical piece by Andrew Ross Sorkin at the New York Times today, he says the tax bill soaks some of rich Americans, but it doesn't soak the richest. It is the pretty rich right below that level that may get hit. The W-2 employee making several hundred thousand dollars to millions of dollars a year with high state and local taxes that will not be fully deductible may see a higher tax bill. If they have an expensive home, they won't be able to deduct as much mortgage interest. And the chief executives of many large publicly traded companies who often itemize large unreimbursed business expenses, which will no longer be allowed. So despite the uh, phony marketing that this is a tax cut for everybody and it's going to stimulate the economy and all, you know, all boats will rise with the higher tide, it's bullshit. This is narrowly focused to benefit a very small group of corporations and individuals. I want to credit Steve Horn a young journalist who I've been following for several years. He's now working at the Young Turks, and he has been working on a series exposing the big delivery companies, UPS and FedEx, because they wrangle tax breaks out of local communities where they build distribution centers. And they have been uh, promoting the Trump tax package with the phony promise that it will help create more jobs at FedEx and UPS. And Horn reports that these companies already have billions of dollars in cash on hand, are investing hundreds of millions in initiatives that stand to reduce their employment levels. 
Uh, Horn has discovered patent applications for package handling automation, delivery drones, driverless trucking systems. Uh, they just ordered a fleet, uh, UPS did, uh, a fleet of, uh, of electric trucks from the fine folks at Tesla. And Horn notes that FedEx and UPS already received millions in tax subsidies, including in Illinois, Indiana, and Tennessee. And Elizabeth Warren, the senator from Massachusetts, has picked up on this, saying giant corporations like UPS and FedEx have billions of dollars cash on hand that they could already be using to increase wages or hire more workers. If they aren't using this money to improve the lives of Americans now, there is no reason to believe they'll do otherwise with the windfall they'll get if Republicans pass this reckless tax bill. And Steve Cohn, K-O-H-N, he's been on this program before. He is the whistleblower attorney based in Washington, D.C. He's got an op-ed in the Post today. And I'm going to change the headline. The GOP tax bill will make America great again for tax cheats. Here's how. And what Cohn exposes is that there were two provisions that were in the bill before it went to the House Senate Conference Committee, and those two provisions have been deep-sixed. And they were aimed at enhancing the role of whistleblowers by making sure that they get a reward and that that reward is not excessively taxed. In 2006, Congress passed the IRS uh, whistleblower law designed to encourage the detection of tax fraud. And under this provision, whistleblowers are entitled to a financial reward of 15 to 30 percent of tax proceeds collected. Proceeds. But the IRS is trying to wriggle out of it by saying, well, uh, we'll pay that on tax money collected, but not on penalties or interest. But the term proceeds, <laughs> I think, is pretty clear about that. And Cohn points out, that uh, this provision was just cut in the conference uh, process, no explanation. And they also cut a provision from the Senate bill that would have protected corporate whistleblowers from double taxation on their awards. Under a Supreme Court ruling that upheld an internal IRS policy, if a whistleblower wins an award, he or she must pay income tax on the attorney fee portion, even if the attorney also pays income tax on the same amount. These are efforts clearly designed to discourage whistleblowers. And that becomes a way of enabling tax cheats. <laughs> Isn't it beautiful to be alive in America today? Well, I want to pause for a second like I do every day and give special thanks to people who support my work here at the Peter B. Collins Podcast. People like John Molitor, he kicks in 20 bucks a month. Thank you, John. Stuart Russell, 10 bucks a month. And Andy Rush and Mark Brodsky are longtime supporters of this podcast. I invite you to join them if the holiday season gives you extra impetus or you're at the end of a good year, the stock market was good to you, or maybe you made some money in a, in a legitimate way. <laughs> well, uh, if you want to be generous, I am ready to accept your generosity. Just visit PeterBCollins.com. Click on the menu button, pull it down, click on Become a Subscriber. It takes you to the sign-up page, and bam. In a minute or two, you can choose the level of support that's comfortable for you. Well, yesterday, to no surprise, the Trump White House confirmed suspicions and has formally accused North Korea of creating the WannaCry cyber attack that hit the uh, uh, many targets last summer. Thomas Bossert. Trump's Homeland Security Advisor, wrote an op-ed published in the Wall Street Journal and said that the conclusion is based on evidence that he did not disclose. Now, I'm always skeptical of these things because we know that it's very easy to fake the origins of a cyber attack. And the North Koreans, in my view, haven't shown that kind of uh, cyber warfare savvy, even though Obama blamed them for the Sony attack, and I'm still unconvinced about that. At any rate, if we take this at face value, the big omission in blaming North Korea is that the White House failed to mention that North Korea used a cyber weapon that was stolen from the American National Security Agency, we think by the shadow brokers. But it's too embarrassing to acknowledge 
our own failings in cyber warfare. And this is at the heart of many of our problems. We believe that using drones and cyber attacks, that we can use our technical superiority over others. But the blowback when our weapons fall into the hands of other people is very clear. And the drone technology that gave us an advantage over the last 10 years or so is basically evaporated now. Most other countries have caught up with the U.S. in the uh, use of unmanned aerial vehicles. And it's ironic that the young man, 23-year-old Marcus Hutchins, who actually ended the uh, ransomware attack called Wanna Cry, after he discovered a vulnerability and was able to go in there and essentially uh, trick the, uh, the malware into shutting itself down, well, he is uh, on trial. <laughs> Three months after he killed the uh, WannaCry virus, the FBI arrested him in Las Vegas at the airport, accusing him of helping in 2014 to create and distribute a little-used malware named Kronos that could steal banking credentials. And the fallout from WannaCry was pretty substantial. The attack infected more than 200,000 computers in 150 different countries. Total economic loss was uh, uh, amounting to $4 billion. The U.K.'s National Health Service was one of the major networks that was attacked. FedEx uh, had a delivery unit called TNT Express that was significantly affected by the virus. Microsoft blamed the U.S. for the attack. Yes, saying the NSA stockpiled software vulnerabilities which had subsequently been stolen by a third party. Have you noticed that the Islamic State is gone from Syria? Was it Trump's secret plan? Is the plan still secret? Did he actually pull that off? I don't really know. Because, of course, it would have been secret. But Bashar al-Assad has prevailed in this long-running civil war, vanquished the proxy fighters that were inserted into that war by Saudi Arabia, the U.S., Iran, perhaps others. And peace talks have broken down once again in Geneva. The Syrian government said that three years of these talks have yielded nothing. And so the struggle continues for the future of Syria. But it does appear that for now, the military wing of the Islamic State is out of business. I wouldn't say they're all gone. They may resurface in a different form. But just a few clicks away in Yemen, the Houthi rebels have launched another ballistic missile into Saudi Arabia. For the second time in two months, the Saudis are claiming that their missile defense intercepted and rendered this attack harmless. Now, they lied about missile defense on the previous attack, so we'll wait for further analysis to see if, uh, once again, they're lying about the use of Patriot missiles. And I'm noting in this article from the New York Times, which says the Saudis are at the forefront of a coalition that has been waging a bombing campaign in Yemen for two and a half years against the rebels. Now, that is narrowly true. But the U.S. was launching drone strikes, was supporting different factions of the rebels. And, uh, you know, <laughs> we have been knee-deep in Yemen uh, for almost six or seven years now. But that is widely written out of accounts of the conflict that continues there today. Now, the Saudis have accused Iran of backing the Houthis with weapons and expertise, including these ballistic missiles. And I consider that an open question. Now, the U.S. has flatly accused Iran of supplying them. And last week at a weird photo op, Nikki Haley, the U.N. ambassador, stood in front of what the U.S. said were Iranian-made missiles, including what they said was the one that was fired at Riyadh's international airport in November. But cryptically, the Times reports... The Defense Department has officials who say they doubted that the remnants on display validated Ms. Haley's claims. 
and I don't know what to make of that. Is this a way of saying that that was just a completely fabricated photo op and that the missile fragment she stood in front of was just <laughs> not related to the attack on the Riyadh airport? I don't know, but I think we deserve to know. Because if the U.S. is using phony evidence, fake evidence, to support these unproven contentions of Iranian assistance to the rebels in Yemen, well, we should know that. The U.S. is isolated at the United Nations right now after it had to veto a resolution supported by all other 14 members of the Security Council, which called on President Trump to rescind his declaration of Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. And this just shows how the world is united against this move. Trump essentially jumped the shark and gave away a prize to Israel that everyone had agreed would be ultimately decided by two-party negotiations with the Palestinians. And while Trump thinks this is going to move the ball down the field and peace is going to break out, it's just a ridiculous, regressive move that does set back the prospects quite a bit. Well, the Senate Intelligence Committee, which of course has fully proven the collusion between Trump and Russia, oh, wait a minute, did they? No, 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 they haven't. Uh, they've decided now to look into collusion between Russia and the Green Party candidate Jill Stein. And everybody's seen the photo of Stein sitting at that banquet table with Vladimir Putin across the table from her. He was sitting, uh, Putin was sitting next to uh, then uh, uh, Mike Flynn. He, he was a retired general. He was an advisor to Trump on the campaign. And from that photo, people infer that Stein had some illicit relationship with the Russians. Now, unlike General Flynn... Jill Stein paid her own way to that dinner in Russia, and now the Senate investigators are requesting documents from Jill Stein, her campaign, and Dennis Trainer Jr., who's a talented uh, video creator who worked on and off for Stein as a communications uh, consultant or assistant, and he was informed of the committee's request because his cell phone had been a major point of contact for people trying to reach Jill Stein. And that includes producers from the dreaded RT network. And that appears to be the focus. That's what Trainer thinks, that they are looking to tie her to RT and the alleged propaganda operation that had so much influence on the U.S. election in 2016. And I think in some ways this is just a uh, an effort to... Uh, kind of rationalize any further investigation of the Clinton campaign uh, by the Senate Intelligence Committee, because Chair Richard Burr, Republican from uh, one of the Carolinas, was saying, well, there are two other campaigns we're looking at, and he's ruled out Bernie Sanders, saying, well, we're only looking at people who ran in the general election. And by the Watson powers of deduction that I have, I think that eliminates everybody but Hillary Rodham Clinton. And we'll have to see where that goes. Over at the House Judiciary Committee, they are working to put together a bill to reauthorize the surveillance program under the FISA law known as 702. And 702 taps into American networks of communication. And the FBI is able to review materials collected through 702 without any warrant or action by the FISA court. And the competing bills from the House and Senate would extend the FISA law, but put limits on Section 702. The House Judiciary proposal uh, requires the FBI in criminal cases to obtain a warrant before being able to view anything resulting from uh, a query for information about Americans in this database. But that requirement under the House language wouldn't apply to counterterrorism or counterintelligence. But the Senate version creates a hurdle for the FBI requiring it to submit a formal request to the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court. 
and it doesn't appear to have an exemption or exception for counterintelligence activities. So we'll see where that goes, but I fear that the Republican leadership will not allow any meaningful amendments like the ones that are proposed and will try to ram it through unchanged. Also at the House Judiciary Committee, there is a, uh, a, a competition to see who takes the place of the ranking member, John Conyers, who recently resigned amid allegations of sexual misconduct. And the two contenders are Zoe Lofgren from Silicon Valley and Jerry Nadler of New York City. And I've interviewed both of them. I think they're very competent people. They are both very strong on civil liberties, and they're both very critical of domestic surveillance. The one real difference is that Lofgren is closer to the tech industry in Silicon Valley. She's not a rubber stamp for them, but she does often reflect their interests. And uh, we'll be watching to see who prevails in this internal party struggle. If you listened to my podcast yesterday, you know I had more stories than I had time for, and I have time now to catch up on the stories that I missed yesterday. So let's dive into it here. Over at the Center for De uh, Disease Controls, uh, Centers for Disease Control, <laughs> I always mess up where that S is, uh, we have learned that the Trump administration has instructed that certain words not be used in budget requests. Now, this doesn't appear to apply across the board at the CDC to their health investigations, studies, or reports. But the order is that the banned words are diversity, entitlement, fetus, transgender, vulnerable, evidence-based, and science-based. I guess they figured it would trigger bad reaction from the Trumper or from his minions, his anti-science minions, on Capitol Hill. Over at the EPA, it's almost a kind of martial law, a crackdown on potential critics of Scott Pruitt or Trump. And we learn that a Virginia-based lawyer working with a Republican campaign research group called America Rising has filed a series of Freedom of Information Act requests to get at the emails of EPA employees who he suspects have been critical of Pruitt or Trump or of the new direction of the agency, uh, <laughs> rolling back regulations and enabling polluters. Well, it turns out that uh, this company, Definers Public Affairs, has received a $120,000 contract from the EPA, and they're described as a press clipping service. They're not offering any advice. They're just collecting uh, media coverage of the EPA and delivering it to the agency. And has anyone told them about the free Google Alert service? <laughs> but this is clearly an underhanded effort to intimidate and silence inside critics at the EPA. And this is a stinky problem. At the Washington headquarters, we have learned that there is at least one water fountain where a sewage-like sludge is oozing out, overflowing onto the floor. I guess uh, the standards have eroded badly <laughs> if they're not even willing to fight for clean water at EPA HQ. Well, last week we reported how Rex Tillerson went freelance, and Rexon, the guy who plays Secretary of State in this uh, soap opera, he kind of went off, uh, off message, I guess, and he said he was willing to we meet with representatives of North Korea without preconditions. Well, he had lunch at the White House, ate some humble pie, and three days after going off message, Rexon was back on message, saying that North Korea must earn its way to negotiations. A sustained cessation of North Korea's threatening behavior must occur before talks can begin. North Korea must earn its way back to the table. The pressure campaign must and will continue until denuclearization is achieved. I think that uh, Rexon will be heading into a sunny retirement in Texas sometime early next year. I mentioned earlier the issues related to Trump's recognition of Jerusalem as the Israeli capital, and a total of eight Palestinians have been killed, 82 injured in the protests that have followed. 
and of course most of these were killed by Israeli soldiers or airstrikes overreacting to the protests of the Palestinians. And in Indonesia on Sunday, 80,000 people rallied in Jakarta against Trump's recognition of Jerusalem as the capital of Israel, and they have announced that they are promoting an Indonesian boycott of American products and services. Hey, how about a little boycott, divestment, and sanctions aimed at the U.S.? I think that's fair play. And finally today, there's been an ugly, brutal crackdown on Palestinian protests, not only by Israelis, but also by the Palestinian Authority. And a couple of days ago, The Intercept reported about the human rights activist Issa Amro. And he has a group named Youth Against Settlements. He recently was on Capitol Hill in Washington, met with members of Congress. And it's not a surprise that he has drawn the ire of Israeli security forces. He was detained and interrogated in early September, but he wasn't in an Israeli military prison. He was being held in a jail controlled by the Palestinian Authority. And what was his offense? He had posted on Facebook criticizing the Palestinian uh, Authority's arrest of six journalists in August and calling on President Mahmoud Abbas to resign. So they put him in a cell, a cramped cell. He was repeatedly interrogated over a six-day period. And this is an indication of how the Palestinian Authority is operating in an authoritarian manner. He is facing charges in both Israeli military court and the Palestinian Authority's civilian court. AMRO has become the most high-profile example of a simultaneous crackdown by Israeli and Palestinian security forces. Uh, these, these days, things just get more, ar- more bizarre, more arbitrary, and more ugly. And on that happy note, it's time for Roy Rogers to come in here and play me out. Thanks for listening to my daily news and comment podcast. It's available on YouTube. Happy trails to you until we meet again. Happy trails to you. Keep smiling. Up.